Well, good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE, and welcome to the annual Sir Patrick Gillam Lecture. It's a great honor to welcome Giancarlo Farras, the Vice President of Benitez, the Brazilian Development Bank, the largest development bank and most important international financial institution in Latin America. And I might add, one of the largest and key financial institutions in the world that takes a primary interest in the issues of economic development. My name is Craig Calhoun. I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm pleased to be your host. The Sir Patrick Gillam Lecture Series was established in 2005 with a lecture delivered every year by a distinguished speaker on questions concerning development and growth prospects in emerging economies around the world. An early emphasis on Asia has now expanded to include Africa and Latin America. This year's lecture inaugurates what I hope will be a growing emphasis on connections to Latin America, but also connections of Latin America to the world. Honoring Benitez and recognizing its role, we recognize um, not only uh, Brazil, but Brazilian leadership in international development. The lecture series is hosted by the LSE, but sponsored by St Standard Chartered Bank as part of a generous endowment to the school, which also includes a chair in the government and international relations departments, currently held by Professor John Seidel. The chair of the lecture series are named after Sir Patrick Gillam, a former chairman of Standard Chartered Bank and former head of BP. A towering figure in the world of British business and finance before his retirement a decade ago, Sir Patrick is one of the LSE's most distinguished alumni and served on the Board of Governors and in many other ways has been a generous benefactor to the school. We are very grateful to have him here with us on this occasion, along with his wife, Diana. Jean Carlos is an economist with a special expertise in industrial organization and competitiveness, innovation and business strategies, as well as financing and production development policies. A graduate of the Catholic University of Minas Gerais with degrees in economics and journalism, he received his PhD in economics and public policy from the University of Sussex but I like to think we should consider him an honorary LSE alumnus because he did a fair amount of his work in our library while his wife received an MSc in demography from the LSE. Giancarlo's first pursued an academic career as an economist, writing numerous articles, essays, and books, and winning appointment as a professor of economics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where he served as director of the Economics Institute. He then served as director of the Production and Corporate Development Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in famous CEPOL in Santiago, Chile, before joining the Brazilian Development Bank, Benitez. This evening, he will speak on the topic of the challenges of engaged development in Brazil, an homage to Albert Hirschman and Oscar Niemeyer, two of the greats in the field whom we have lost recently, but we'll revisit in this lecture. Thank you for being with us, Jean-Carlos. Look forward to the lecture. I hope that they can put, there is a presentation. I don't know if it is. Let's make sure it's loaded. Got it. Oh, there. There we're all right. But in this Thank case, you. I will sit there. Right. <laughs> Better. Yes. Um, the invitation to this year's uh, Gilliam Lecture came to me as a, very much as a surprise and great responsibility. Uh, the chair especially Professor Sidio, wanted to try out different regions and different perspectives. Uh, so for me, it is uh, an honor to stand here with you. Uh, I must thank Professor Sidio, Professor Wade, uh, um, LSE Director, Professor Calhoun, especially to Sir Gilliam and Standard Chartered to make this intellectual space for me. 
I try to approach this lecture from a multidisciplinary uh, perspective, uh, of course without abandoning uh, the economist one. This was uh, only possible because of the turns that my personal and professional life has taken uh, until this podium, and I do hope that we'll continue turning around uh, in the years to come. Uh, and for that, I think the two elements were fundamental, luck and friends. Luck to be in different places and different, in different times, including 30 years ago, as Professor Calhoun has said, here at the, at, at, uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, its infrastructure then allowed me to conduct my research, um, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and luck to be sitting at the position that I am at BNDES, uh, for which I might thank my colleagues here, uh, you know, Jaime is one of them, and the Brazilian government, which is represented here by the Brazilian ambassador, Roberto Jaguaribe, a man of diplomacy and a man of public policies. We, we are related when he was, for some time, he was engaged into industrial policies. And the second part with friends. Um, they are a source of constant renewal and fun. Uh, they, you know, uh, there are few of them here, Julian and Claire and Howie and Donia, are two of them, very, uh, very special ones. Uh, but just above friends, uh, much of what I am, uh, and only the good part, uh, comes from family, and within family, my lifelong partner, Elizabeth. Uh, her solidarity to me is just amazing. Other nice features of her, I won't tell you. It's just, just to keep to ourselves. So the lecture. Um, you know, you, uh, if, if you see there, there are three related issues. There is this, uh, there are persons, there is a country, and there is the issue of development, yeah? Uh, and I'm try, I will try to bring them together. And uh, the message being, in this uncertain world of today, more than ever, ideas and politics uh, are necessary and they should converge. And this is why the notion of, you know, this is behind the notion of engaged development. Uh, I'm much more going to make the case that we need engaged development rather than open up what uh, the details of it. I would just invite you to engage in engaged development. So, um, and I'm doing this, uh, yeah, I, 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 I thought very much if I should you know, not use this media, but having Nehemiah uh, as one of my inspirations. I thought that uh, some of the images were good. So I'm going to go in four different uh, stages. First, why uh, Hishman and uh, Nehemiah. The second is uh, just a few words on, about this world, yeah? about uh, the trends and uncertainties that uh, surround us. And then the third part about Brazil. Uh, its recent uh, performance, uh, the prospects that we have, and the challenges, and then this timing call for, uh, for engaged development. So this is how I will go about. And the first one, of course, these two gentlemen. Uh, when I start thinking about the, uh, about, uh, uh, the lecture, these two gentlemen had just recently uh, passed away uh, in uh, uh, Hishman in December 10th and uh, Nehemiah just uh, five days before. One, you know, uh, and they were around us for a long, long time. And, the, and the, the idea behind having this homage is uh, that Hishman is an architect of ideas and uh, Nehemiah is an architect of the modern uh, Brazil. 
of the uh, process of urbanization, and he set some landmarks, some physical landmarks, while, Nehemiah, while Hishman set up some uh, uh, intellectual landmarks for the development thinking. So I think it is, you know, the, the uh, bringing together two gentlemen that work on very different fields, but uh, were thinking on the same direction of changing uh, how things were and are. I think it's a nice one. So you, you can read from the uh, quotes that I, uh, I put there that the, they were never uh, complacent with the status quo. Um, so this is why the homage. And, and uh, uh, this, this one here is a, is a museum in the Niterói. Niterói is a city across the bay from Rio. So you can see the, the famous sugar loaf from a different perspective. And it's a round thing. Yeah? So you, the, you start seeing the world from a different perspective rather than the traditional view from the sugar loaf. So there is these symbolic things. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Hishma, Hishman on the other side, uh, should be an H here, uh, said that he was never a happy man with the things that he were, was working with. And every time that an idea came up, uh, and even from another field, he would move uh, immediately. So he started long ago, and I think that his period at the London School in the year 35, more or less, is when he, he started to really organize himself as an economist in trade. And then from there he moved to the 70s, 80s when he started, you know, he sort of moved himself to a more philosopher position when he started to discuss, to discuss culture and politics with his work on is it voice and the, the behavior of society, is it voice loyalty, uh, so m much more on how people behave themselves and organize themselves uh, with things. So Hishman and Nehemiah, they very much inspired me to rethink uh, of what development is, and, uh, 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 or, or at least what it should be. Um, so this is the second part what uh, we have around us, where to this world is going to. Um, and Hishma has a quote saying that, uh, you know, although that is, you know, we see today much more uncertainty, he saw, he, he called it the hidden rationalities, he saw the good in very uh, unstable and very underdevelopment uh, structures and societies. So when something good happens, it occurs as a result of extraordinary circumstances. So an intellectual to be able to capture this, to capture this and put for us is much more, is, I think that uh, artists are much more prepared for that uh, than uh, intellectuals in reality. Uh, there is a verse by one of the uh, Brazilian uh, modernists called Oswald de Andrade. In 1917, he has a verse that said about Sao Paulo, uh, runaways, viaducts, I smell forts, I even smell coffee in the air. So this is Sao Paulo, 1917. He was already seeing the urbanization process in the cars, but still, having the smell of coffee in there. So this is 1917, and he was already foreseeing something that would come up 50 years ahead. So uh, not only the intellectuals, we should look at these artists to see what they're saying, where to world. <sighs> Times of intense and hard changes. Uh, there is another artist, John Steinbeck. Uh, when he wrote about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the recession in the grapes of Ross. He, I, don't, I don't know how many of you has uh, read uh, the grapes of Ross, but he illustrated how the modernization in the east part of the country was moving away 
hundreds of thousands of people to the uh, west side of the country and showing the, the challenges and the shocks between the so-called old and the new, the new machinery, the new agriculture that was coming up. Uh, this is very uh, symbolic. Uh, and if we read what was happening here and trans, uh, then, and if we translate to much of what uh, is happening now, I start thinking to what extent this financial crisis did not come um, to uh, write off the so-called old assets and allow the space in a very savage way uh, for the new to come. So old assets and competence become obsolete during times of change. But even the new is not uh, right, is not uh, stable. And the mortality rates, just think a few years ago, of the bubble, the IT bubble that was happening in the US. So the trial and error is very intense and uncertainty prevails until this emerging paradigm, and this is the Schumpeterian uh, language, being a graduate from the Science Policy Research Unit in Sussex. Uh, this is uh, more or less one of the tribes that I'm associated with. Associated with. Um, uncertainty prevails until this emerging paradigm becomes the dominant. So we are in the middle of this process. And, and being in the middle of this process, uh, it is very hard to see, to organize things. Can we organize things on how to see, how to observe changes? And th there is this nice quote by Oscar Niemeyer. You know, usually we, say, we, we, ha we use this metaphor of the, uh, the trees and the forests, yeah? uh, that you have to look at the trees, but at the same time you have to ha you know, the aggregate the macro and the micro. But he, he, he was not talking about the macro and the micro. He was talking about we should look at the spaces between trees. And this is where the dynamics of things will happen. This is where the new ocean. So this is a very, you know, uh, this is to, to observe changes, we should look at the spaces uh, of where things are moving and new actors coming. And then uh, Hishman comes, that the world is in continuous change uh, with age one's new ideas are predominantly those that contradict the old. Yeah, so this is, uh, these are two gentlemen that live with change. Uh, this picture here is the memorial, uh, the Latin American memorial uh, in this, uh, Sao Paulo. So this, there are two words that I'm going to use and emphasize. One is diversity. Uh, and the other one is divide or heterogeneity. Uh, we know, for, uh, just to give you an idea, the trends and the uncertainties, uh, we know that, for example, China is going to be important. We just don't know how China is going to be important. Yeah? So the trends is something that we more or less can say that uh, it's here to, to stay. Uh, and the, the, the genetic profile is that diversity is something that is going to be with us. Um, there is more voices in world decisions. Uh, the old protagonists remain, um, you know, the US, France, and China, uh, 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 and uh, the UK. And newcomers are trying, just for you, you know, the reference being, uh, look at the fight that is, is at this moment at the IMF and the World Bank, who controls uh, and who has more saying in these international organizations. The Security Council um, in, the, uh, in the UN uh, and the, 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 f the struggle that uh, newcomers are trying to engage in in order to have more voice in, uh, in Hishman's uh, words. This is one. The other one, of course, né, the extreme availability of an access to information. Uh, compared to the years at the LSE here 30 years ago, uh, then the, it, this was the pole of information, its library, but compared to what it was now uh, and then, you know, the amount of information that's available to society, just immense, and you know. The third one is, I don't know how many of you realize that uh, it is already six years, six years since the financial crisis started. And still people are just about to realize this, that this is going to be a crisis of long duration. Yeah? Uh, 
for you to take into consideration in Brazil uh, the crisis that we went, uh, went in it started in 1982 and it took us 25 years to come out and I will explain it took us 12 years from 1982 to 1994 for the, the, uh, for, for, uh, for the Brazilians to stop the bleeding yeah? for the volatility stop in 1994 this is the year of the real plan when inflation was controlled. But it took us another 12 years for investment to start growing ahead of GDP in a systematic way. Yeah? So you have two moments. You know, it's, uh, it's stop the bleeding and then engage into systematic development. And, and there are differences. These are two moments. Uh, so, and we are still on the first part of the game, I think. The other one is this inclusion process. Brazil is uh, highlighted as a country, and I'll show you some data about this inclusion process. But just think of what is happening in Mexico, Indonesia, uh, India, and China. Yeah? Uh, so this is something that is one of the most extraordinary phenomena that this inclusion process, that it's just starting and from the economics and from the consumption side. The, um, the fifth one is that uh, low growth in some markets, but it's still, you know, the US as a relevant market, the UK as a relevant, Europe as a relevant market, and having all these companies spreading, you know, the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians coming up. The name of the game is a fierce competition, yeah? It is going to be very, very hard in every market. It's not only in the international uh, uh, tradables uh, sectors, but uh, a, a very fierce competition for uh, spaces in every, every kind. And of course, given that competition, given inclusion, the pressure on resources, and given a very a broad definition of resources from the environment to iron ore to food, whatever, uh, the pressure is going to be great. But this is interesting, and, and this is different from uh, the recession of the 1920s. Um, the unstoppable, rit unstoppable rhythm of technical progress. Every day we read in the newspaper that something marvelous is coming up. And the last point is that the states, until recently, uh, the activism of states were something that you should put aside. And when the crisis came, this institution um, return, uh, especially in the financial side, uh, less on other side, especially on, uh, uh, on public goods. But uh, the protection against chaos, uh, the institution is the state, and more and more the defense of national interests in this uh, very globalized world. So these are the trends. And then comes the uncertainties, yes? Uh, the uncertainties here, if we can summarize, is the increasing heterogeneity. We know that uh, there is uh, more people coming in to the uh, high table, but we don't know if it is going to be a negotiated or a very conflictive multipolarity. This is something that we still don't know. Uh, democracy, you know, until recently there was one model of democracy, and now you have different models not only of representation, but also more and more uh, there is people that uh, are questioning whether the formal uh, uh, Western type of democracy is a zombie democracy, not real democracy that allows for direct access to power. Information abounds, but uh, T.S. Eliot already, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this verse, uh, where is the... Uh, uh, the knowledge we lost in information, where is the wisdom we lost in knowledge? So maybe we can, ac we can acquire information, uh, we can even invest in knowledge, but wisdom is something of a different nature. Yes? The indignados, indignados is the uh, Spanish uh, word for the young uh, that are, you know, the occupying places and, and going for direct action. We just don't know the nature of the outrage. Is the outrage of the Arabs the same as the outrage of the Chilean students that have been in the places for the last six years, kicking out four education ministers, running across two 
uh, governments, and they still there, yeah? and changing leadership. Uh, uh, they are different. Yeah, the 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 young in Europe, they see they, there is this hope hopeless, and these are the people that will have to pay the bill in the future uh, for all. Yeah, so it is something that we still don't know. Compared to uh, the young of the 60s, the young of the 60s were going either on the left revolutionary or the peace and love and the freedom. But today there are no poles or direction of where they would be going to. We don't know if uh, this society is the individualist, uh, groupism, you know, we just bunch together with people similar to you and fight against others, or if, if, you know, if this networkism that is around, if it is going to mean anything in terms of organization. Resources in the environment is always a question, and no need to talk more about this. The, uh, there is this coinage of emerging countries, yeah? and more and more I believe that these are emerging middle classes. Uh, the few references that we have about middle class, the stereotype is the American, yes? Uh, the sub suburbs, the SUV, the uh, savings for uh, the college for the kids. Uh, and that, so that's the stereotype, the more stereotype that we have. We don't know what the aspiration of the emerging middle class is. We don't even know their aesthetics ideals, yeah? which is not only something that is building up from them, but also very much impacted by all the media that is around us from the nights of life. Yeah? So uh, it's something that is still not organized. Huh? Um, the last time I was here uh, at the UK, uh, I was shown this 3D printer. Yeah? And they talk wonders about the 3D printers. So it is, is mass customized production achievable, and what will mean? Yeah? Uh, we don't know if it is fierce competition. We don't know the competitive practices. You know, it's cost or differentiation, the basic sources of competition, but we don't know anymore what it is. And they state, yeah, if they state if there is one role model, yeah, the uh, traditional uh, welfare state that we thought and the Nordic countries follow, uh, and the Americans came with a new deal. Uh, we just don't know. We had the Chinese, uh, we had the Indians, we had the Americans, we had the Europeans, we had the Brazilians. Uh, and we don't know which, what are, what are public goods today? Information, culture, environment. It's, you know, and, and the old public goods, especially in the developing areas, is still very much on, yeah, the sanitation roads, yeah, the basic uh, issue. So this is a much more complex. And then the thinking, you know, if you put the social thinking, political thinking, cultural thinking. So this is, I was talking to Professor Calhoun uh, just briefly before, and uh, he was very proud of LSC coming, having different people from different areas of knowledge and areas of backgrounds bringing in discussion to this uh, institution, which is something that I think that we should look uh, very carefully. Brazil. Um, and this is, it's not a sale. This is one of the architecture of the palaces in, uh, uh, in, in Brasilia. Uh, what are our, our prospects? And I'll look on three different, uh, from the three different angles. This is the humanité, this is the uh, you know, uh, a long and winding road, the building goes like this, the French uh, newspaper designed by, uh, by Nehemiah. So the first one, if we look at the data in itself, we have stability from a macro perspective. You, you know, if you compare to what is happening around the world, public debt from 2002 to 2012 uh, from 60 to 35%. Inflation, it's there, you know, running down, and it's around five, five and a half. Very much stable. The volatility that we had in the years before is much less. And our uh, structural weakness was the uh, external vulnerability. 
is very much now protected with the reserves, yes? Uh, so they are improving. The, con the macro fundamentals are improving. But on the other hand, if we, ha if we think in long term, this is still to be conquered. Investment and savings to GDP, how much we save and how much we invest, is still between 15 and 19%. Uh, and savings below investment, so this puts our current account uh, needing resources. Although, uh, if we look in terms of uh, attraction, you know, attractiveness of Brazil, just last year it was 65 billion US of foreign direct investment that went into the country, and to a certain uh, 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 extent, it uh, 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 organized our, our accounts. But if we look, in terms of uh, how we finance uh, our development, uh, you see that uh, you know, using credit or using bonds, you see that Brazil is in, anyway, it is a shallow uh, finance industry. Uh, we can move in a very uh, um, uh, balanced way. We can move more towards dependent on corporate, like Korea does or Norway going on the credit. It's still, but we're still very shallow. Uh, but in place, and this is something, in place there is this safeguard uh, for long-term financing and a very uh, a relevant uh, institution, uh, which is BNDES. Uh, this uh, picture here shows you uh, development banks from two different perspectives. One is that the stock of credit, it's the blue one, is the stock of credit to GDP. And you see that the Brazilians are not very different from the uh, Germans or from the Chinese. Not many people realize that KFW is the second or the third largest uh, financing uh, institution in Germany yeah, as a development bank or the Chinese, the China Development Bank is very powerful. So you see that uh, we are more of the, the, the relative importance to GDP is similar. But then if you compare credit, the stock of credit to total credit, you see that the relevance of BNDES is much higher, showing that our financing industry is still uh, very uh, 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 underdeveloped, if you wish, in terms of the long-term financing, although that for, for short term, uh, Brazil is a very sophisticated uh, financial market. And the role of these banks, uh, they have been around for uh, uh, four sets of reasons. One is to finance expansion of economic activities. People use a lot uh, the term uh, market failures, but I think it's much more than market failure is expansion of capacity, fill gaps, fixed failures, induced externalities is much wider dimension uh, than just a market failure, unless we define market failure as many things. The other one is if they are uh, developing institutions, they also have a role to play in fostering uh, the uh, finance industry as any economic activity. Uh, development banks with the crisis became very well known as a contributor to systemic stability. Uh, their uh, their relevant, uh, relative position in, uh, during 2007, 8, 9 just increased sharply in, in most countries that had these institutions. And finally, being a public institution, they have a role to play in appropriating and distributing uh, returns of financial investment decisions. Uh, our, in Brazil, our national treasure uh, is very keen on the profits that uh, BNDES has. So the challenge, although we have this institution, the challenge in Brazil nowadays is not the crowding out, but the crowding in of the, fin of the private finance industry into long-term financing, especially given the investment prospects that the country has. This is one. The second one is well known. Uh, you, you just have to see uh, it is the economic inclusion. You have to see this is the triangle of 2003. Uh, you know, most of where the class, this is in a uh, number of people, yeah? Uh, 175 million, 96 were here, uh, 65 in class uh, C, etc. So eight years ago, uh, eight years after, there were 30 million that, of people that move upwards. 
uh, from uh, uh, 69 to 100. So the shape is much more a polygon uh, than a triangle. So there is uh, this emptying of class C, D, and E and moving upwards. And this is very much not only because of the Bosa Familia, the uh, conditional, uh, the income condition, uh, 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 tra uh, conditional transfer, but also because of the policy of the minimum wage that were above uh, the uh, inflation. In 10 years, there were, uh, the minimum wage increased 75% in real terms. So it uh, expanded the, uh, the payroll, the mass of, uh, of uh, money that was uh, in the hands of people allowing uh, us to move into this mass consumption. But even so, you know, it's, it's spectacular improvements. Uh, this is a change. I don't know how many of you are very familiar with my country, but this is a change in a historical paradigm. Yeah? This is a change over three or 400 years. This is just, you know, and the question being, why did it take so long? Yeah? Uh, but it is a change. Uh, it is just starting this process of change as inequality is still very high, yes? If you see the Gini index, although there is this trend towards decreasing, it's still at 0.5, uh, uh, and it is very high in any uh, civilized dimension, if I can uh, use this term. This is something that we have, I have been thinking for some time. Um, Brazil has been dependent very much on the moods of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the international market, especially on commodities. Um, and I think that there is a trend now of the diversification of sources of dynamism in the economy. And I'm taking here demand-led perspective, yes? So in the, it, in the 2000s, uh, there was this boom of uh, the commodities, especially because of the Chinese and the minerals. But the, uh, uh, the prices now tend uh, to, uh, to decline, but if you think of the process of inclusion that is coming in, the, all the agriculture-related commodities, it's going to be very relevant in the years to come. Now, in 2005 and 6, because of the uh, in, in, inclusive policies of government, then there was this process of the beginning of the mass consumption, the data that I show. In 2007, the government launched its first infrastructure projects uh, for 20 years or so before, there was nothing done in terms of energy, roads, railways, etc. So there is a starting process here that has still a long way to go. We started moving first in energy, and uh, last year to now, the logistics, everything that has to do with infrastructure started to be a source of concern and actions. But it's still, uh, Brazil has challenges not associated with the political decision or send on the wheel to make things running, but it is a process of reinventing the wheel as our institutions were not ready to put a major process of infrastructure investments uh, uh, to run. Yeah, you, don't have, you didn't have the legal, the environment, the engineering, the financial modeling. All of these are still being designed and it's very hard, it's almost painful to put these things off the ground. And in, in 2009, uh, the symbolic year here is uh, when the government uh, uh, put out this massive program of popular housing called Minha Casa, Minha Vida, that it's still a long way to go. Uh, for you to have an idea, at the, in this year, in 2009, credit to housing, uh, to total credit, was uh, about, uh, to, to GDP, was about 3.5%. Now it's double that. If you think in terms of any country, it is 50% or something. In Brazil, it's just six. And we forecast it growing, you know, uh, in two years' time, it will reach 9% of credit to housing, which is absolutely ridiculous. And it shows you not only how repressed we are, and if you, have no, if you know Brazil, the life conditions, except in the middle classes, the life conditions of people are not nice. Um, although there is these sources of dynamism, efficiency is very low. Sorry for this graph, but this is basically taking the labor product, this is labor productivity taking and, and the gap with the U.S. So the GDP per person, the U.S. being 100, uh, this is Brazil. It is 
20 points. So we are very, and uh, there was, you know, we moved backwards, now it is at 20%. So our efficiency in terms of labor productivity is very low relatively to the, uh, this ref, the US reference. And if you think in terms of growth, this is a long-term perspective, our efficiency is being uh, increasing very little. So we still have a long way to go. And it is a moment that uh, either we move towards being better in things that we do, or we will have a, a, a big problem ahead. We're going to a demographic transition, uh, meaning that uh, there is less people entering the labor market uh, in the years to come. Uh, this is the ideal moment, if you think in aggregate terms, of giving a productivity shock in the economy because you have to absorb less labor uh, entering the, uh, the market every year. Uh, if we do not do that, if there is no efficient drive in this society, we're going to be a very expensive market and very inefficient market, which is something that uh, structurally is very complex. Uh, the other one is the structural weakness of our country's competences. This is just a graph that shows workers with at least the high school completed, yeah? And we, a third of our labor force has uh, high school completed. Uh, this is, you know, uh, it is a long way to go. And if we think in terms of the investment in innovation, uh, although relative to Latin America, we are very uh, well and we are improving, this is still 1.2% of GDP compared to things, you know, even China, or Korea, or the US, or Germany, and so on. So in terms of the competence, or human capital, whatever the name that you want, uh, this is very complex. This is uh, a drawing. Uh, Nehemiah designed, this is the CIEP. CIEP is the integrated school system that they put in the state of Rio, was for the first time, the students would stay in the school the whole day, which for us, it was a novelty. Yeah? Uh, if you think in terms of uh, the country where you live, this is, you know, uh, most of the students in Brazil stay half time, uh, half day in school. Okay, so we have this disjunctive. Although there are signs that are positive, uh, it is not ensured still where we're going. We can go back to the past, that is, uh, you know, Brazil as a provider of natural resources as the stereotype that we have. Or we can move, and we can evolve, uh, uh, nurturing the diversification of dynamism. And, and these are the, the drawings that Nehemiah did on the columns, how the columns, the, the design of the columns uh, change over time. So these are the two uh, 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 challenges, you know, the disjunction. And I think that the, the most important challenge that our society has is uh, to negotiate the tensions of unbalanced growth. I would just uh, describe you the, uh, uh, what I mean. Uh, if you think in terms of maturation process of things, of investments, we now, we now have consumption. Uh, and consumption is an immediate process. Uh, to supply for this immediate consumption, you need factories that take, you know, for example, a TV factory takes two or three years of maturation. Yes, you can import, but suppose that uh, you can either import or produce locally. So there is a tension here between the desired consumption and the capacity to uh, supply that. Then this process has been going on in the past few years in Brazil. So you have cars along the road, so you know it's crowded. The investment, the maturation period for infrastructure is much longer than the factory for the cars. So there is a tension here between the, between the time of consumption, the time of production of cars, and the timing of building infrastructure. And if you think in terms of the competence, uh, we have a son that is uh, 27. He's just finished his master in engineering. Uh, it took us 27 years to form a master in engineering. Yeah, so it's the maturation process of competence is much longer. So ideally, if we could design the world, we should go capabilities of people, invest in infrastructure, 
put the factories, then you start consuming. But uh, life is not like that, yeah? It's the other way around. So the tensions of arising from the different periods, the of, of tensions arising from unbalanced growth, which Hishman thought that this was a source of the dynamics because you're provoking that things will be solved. If politically, if the Brazilians are able to negotiate the tensions arising from that, then we'll be. So this takes us for the call to engage develop. And basically, um, uh, the first question is, can we theorize about development? Uh, is it a possible in the world? Because development implies choices. So it is a political process. Development implies long process of changes. And development is time and place specific. The UK has a development challenge. The Japanese have a development challenge. Agile has a development challenge. So choices in process may be hard to be reflected in concepts, but without ideas, we may be lost, not in translation, but in transition and be uh, So this is the challenge that we are, have. And this is why, my first point, this is why we should bring together ideas and high politics. Yes? This is why we need the thoughts of Hishman in terms of trespassing. This is why we should be inspired by uh, Nehemiah saying that the straight line is not something that attracts him. What attracts him is the free and sensual curve, and then he goes of the river, of the clouds, of the waves, of the body of the women. Yeah? Uh, so this is what, uh, much more than the headlines, and the success of a theory, if it's possible, is that suddenly, suddenly, everyone begins to reason according to new categories. But what are these new categories? Yes? And I'll start giving that uh, I'm trying to bring together ideas in politics. I'll be normative. And this is a personal, a personal vision. And I'm going to organize in four blocks of the political, of the ethical, the social, and the economics. And these are the components that I think that should be part of a development agenda. The first one is the right to equality of opportunities. Yeah? The Japanese are great in this. Yes, they provide equality of opportunities for 100 something million. Uh, at least in terms of equality of opportunities, they have done that. The second, and it's almost, I don't know if it's right, you know, ideally, these, uh, these, this dimension here should be spinning around my, my limits to the PowerPoint. Uh, the, the second one is the contemporary uh, public goods. I already mentioned that. It's not only sanitation but the access to information or, or the access to culture. Um, the third one is very uh, dear to the uh, Schumpeterians, uh, that we should have relatively to one country move and evol uh, evolve towards activity that are higher in terms of income elasticity of demand and strong productivity potential. So they are dynamic. Yeah? So it's not that we should be high tech, but we should do things tomorrow with a more dynamic way than we are doing today. And probably, I don't know, I very much like this, the more and better workplaces, yeah? because it reveals not only the amount, quantity, but also that uh, the, work, the, the things that you are doing are improving in time. And so these are the dimensions that I think that compose, very personal, compose the dimensions of development. And we have to move from the visions to the projects, especially political projects. And, and uh, this drawing here is our national congress. Yes? Uh, so development implies political projects. And development projects demand enchanting engaging. If you think in terms of political projects, there are two personalities in this world today that represent well uh, you know, this idea uh, of visions to projects, Nelson Mandela and Lula. These are two individuals that actually have placed visions to projects to actually change in societies. Uh, development projects demand enchanting. I don't know how many of you have heard 
uh, either Mandela or Lula speaking. And these are guys that are just amazing in terms of the things that they say. And they are in the game of engaging political forces and civil society to fight against the small thing. Or even uh, development projects demanding Chantanin engaging economic agents to invest intangible, most important in intangible uh, assets and capabilities. So this is probably the design, and this is almost to the conclusion. So which development there is the engaged development? And I'm giving here a definition. It's an ethical commitment to process leading to inclusiveness, competitiveness, and sustainability. And for a better world, world, we need also fun, yes? <laughs> so this is it. Is this utopia or not? It's for you to say. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. This is one. I can only say I don't know. Well, maybe, but maybe you will know. But let me offer first my thanks, but second, uh, the comment that I think neither Albert Hirschman nor Australian R would have been against a little utopian thinking to animate the visions and the projects of development. I want to remark on a, uh, just a couple points because I thought you had some, some wonderful things to say and some things that matter for us here. One, that we really have to think what development is or should be. That this requires thinking beyond just a bit more of what we have, a bit more is there. And this is a basic thing for us to think about because it's very tempting and very easy to equate development with growth and to imagine, therefore, it is more of what we already have. And in their different ways, I think both Hirschman and Niemeyer and you tonight um, very much uh, animated this point for us, that it's crucial. You also made another point that I think is, is a, a point of both Hirschman and Niemeyer that is wonderful. When you talked early on about how to observe changes and to organize to observe changes, one of Hirschman's great themes, of course, was observation. You know, he was an economist who was out in the fields in Colombia, who was in factories, who was not simply um, with the computer. And for him and for, indeed, a generation of economists um, after the war, thinking about development in the second half of the 20th century, getting out in the field was crucial, observing, seeing what was going on. And it promoted a kind of empiricism and a kind of engagement with reality that was crucial. For Niemeyer as well, we think of the artist, the visionary, um, but is a visionary who is also an observer of what was going on in life. And, and the translation from observation into art that makes possible the work, makes possible the observations, the, the role of the materials in the architecture, all of this is crucial, I think. And, uh, um, and bringing that out is, is um, extremely important for us um, as social scientists here at the LSE, but as citizens and as people, the, the role of um, stopping to observe in all of this. The, um, I won't try to comment on everything in the wonderful talk, but I want to um, move to say I was also very much taken with the extent to which you included a moment of enchantment in your account of engaged development. And I interpret this in part as a moment of belief in moving beyond just what we see around us. And how projects, how this turn from visions to projects requires um, an element of enchantment and engagement. It's often said of modern society, famously by Max Weber, that disenchantment is its definition. But if so, this is a relatively sad diagnosis in some part. It's said in, about things like religion and the role of religion and have we become disenchanted in relation to spiritualism. But I think that the point of a kind of enchantment that orients us to the future, that orients us to what we can do to move beyond where we are, is tremendously valuable. And so I thank you for that. 
and um, in general for a, a wonderful talk about this. Now I have to ask a question, and in the spirit again of Niemeyer and, um, and even more of Hirschman in this, a question um, on the hard realism side, not the utopian side, um, thinking of the goals, the ethical commitment goals that you set that we should have inclusiveness, competitiveness, sustainability, and fun. And fun is, of course, something that Niemeyer and Hirschman are both embrace in this vision, I agree. Is there any tension here? This is a balancing, I suspect, a compromising, but I worry in particular about a tension between, a tension between all of the regimes of competitiveness organized at a national level and then the challenges of trying also to be inclusive, also to be sustainable, also to have fun, have those more and better workplaces and so forth. Um, are there emerging visions of how to be competitive that don't make all those other things simply afterthoughts to the project of competitiveness? I can, I can answer, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, Professor Calmo, I think that uh, yeah, these, I'm assuming here a dimension of norma normativeness. Okay. Yes? So this should be visions to guide us. But we have to take into consideration, I should make myself more clear, that these, we have to live with contradiction. Yes. Yes? We have to live and we have to negotiate the contradictory sides of things. Uh, so I know that the, it is not a search for equilibrium or balance. I think it's a search of, uh, you know, it's a, a direction uh, in living with the contradictory. It's, well, this is a good Hirschman point with unbalanced development, yeah. right? That yeah. you get the dynamism yeah. from the contradictions, from movement in one direction, correction to the other, yeah. not from a straight line. Yes, but then the tension arises. This right. is why, you exactly. know, this is my point that uh, the, the challenge of the Brazilian society being the capacity to negotiate and to have the so-called patience right. uh, to live with the balance. And, and it is very hard. You know, people that have been for 400, 500 years underprivileged, right. will they have patience? Right. This is, this is Hirschman's famous idea of, of the tunnel, in which he talks about, you know, with, if you're driving in two lanes in a tunnel, car traffic's going in the same direction, it's stopped, there's a traffic jam, and then the cars next to you begin to move a little faster. At first, you may feel optimistic. Oh, that's a good thing, traffic's moving. But if the other ones keep moving faster, then you feel resentful, then you feel angry, then it was... And, and in this dynamic I think you're talking about is exactly the question, can people be patient? And can they accept temporary inequalities on the way to equality or not? And are they committed to each other enough to keep doing it together? Great question. So, thank you. Thank you for this. Let me invite questions from the audience. Sir. Can I ask you, those who ask questions to the audience, to wait for the microphone so they're ready to hear it? You who is a very, uh, I think, uh, a man with a radical background, first working class um, uh, president who is very good development. Though I think there have been earlier radical ones, Kratos, Kubitschek, and Gulat. The president, uh, if I'm if I might, is Dilma Rousseau, who seeks to combine social justice with a policy that attracts international investment. Could you just say something about, she seems to be quite successful at what she's doing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, 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 you have a question? I, I could not understand. I, I understood if I, if... I said, you, I'm looking at the previous president of Brazil. Yes. Dilma Rousseff. Yes. Uh, she's trying to combine social justice with a policy of encouraging international investment. Do you think she's succeeding at that? Um, you about about, um, about maybe two months ago, um, I, I was in an in a event where President Rousseff was there. She's, some people criticize her for not uh, paying much attention to the politics and being this manager trying to organize the, 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 the economy and, uh, you know, being in a painful process of the... Uh, uh, of investments in logistics, the concessions, and bringing investors, and we go in here. This is the stereotype that she has. And she goes into the podium, and she says, people here 
say that I don't pay attention to politics. For me, politics is to take out extreme, po to eradicate extreme po poverty out of this country. This is what my, this is what I call politics. Politics for me is to be able uh, to, to change the regulations in order to make investment in logistics possible. So this is, this is the logic that she has. I think that she's a better strategist than a manager in itself. She has very clear, it's, it's to the extent that her chief of cabinet, she appointed four people that she said, this is something that is mine. The Minister of Finance, of course the Central Bank, uh, the chief of cabinet, the planning business, and the Minister for Social Development. So it's a second-rate ministry that she raised and she put something of her team. You know, she pick up this lady and fuck, and, and uh, targeting at the uh, extreme poverty. So she's very keen on this thing, but it is a difficult political balance, especially with the political system that we have. Not easy. Oh, so, oh, sorry, here the jacket tie got that inside row. What impact does the Brazilian government feel that the Olympics and the World Cup will have, and how do you see the country after three and a half years when it's all over? That we win the championship <laughs> <laughs> in Russia. The Olympics are after the World Cup. Uh, um, that is a great concern. Uh, in terms of the, the, con, uh, the, the, uh, the concept of legacy, yes? Um, so far, what we see, and looking from a very, you know, from a very <laughs> parochial, looking at the city of Rio, uh, the works that they are doing uh, in terms of the infrastructure of changing the access of people moving, I think it will move, the, the, uh, will change the geography of people of displacement of this society. So something will stay. And it's the hard fight. Uh, you know, we have this uh, the stereotype, you have the Barcelona and the Athens as uh, references. So there's a lot of effort uh, to be done on more legacy. But uh, it is very unknown. Uh, it, is, it is a hard uh, uh, issue whether we're going to go more towards legacy. I think in at least the city of Rio will shape completely, the, reshape uh, the geography of the city. So something could will come. Right. And the green shirt here. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm a student here in London School of Economics, and I wanted to know is from a Brazilian who's left Brazil 14 years ago, um, how robust do you see uh, he's going back when he finishes, hopefully, his master's? How is it going to be, how um, sustainable is the development and the growth in Brazil at the moment? And what are the key challenges you think that Brazil needs to still fix to in order to continue I, to be robust? I think you maybe need to repeat yeah. the first part. Yeah, the first, first part. part. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, what is the key challenges and, um, and what is the, what I'm trying to ask is, is how sustainable is the development in Brazil at the moment? And what are the key challenges you see? What do you see, Adam? How sustainable is the development in Brazil? How sustainable in terms of the environment? Environment, yeah. political environment, especially, especially because it's, um, it's always, Brazil's always had this pro problem of um, instability. And um, how, how do you think that yes. will be in the future? Yes. Um, the Brazilians suffer a lot with the volatility, yes? There is a great concern from the, uh, 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 you know, from the executive, uh, you know, the, and the ministers and the and the president, you know, that uh, we should ha keep volatility very low. This is a, a, a matter of concern, and I think that there is a. I hope that uh, the the 25 years of uncertainty uh, put us almost in our gene that uh, we should fight against uh, uncertainty and against volatility. But it is something that we should be alert all the time. It's nothing that you can, okay, relax. It is, it is uh, hard, constant fight. Uh, and, 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 it, and it is a matter of having the direction and being very wise in terms of the fine-tuning elements. 
So the decisions, the macro decisions that are being taken, uh, I think that one of the great favors that this financial crisis did was to open the wardrobe of instruments and not being, you know, people in the past was very narrow in terms of the, of the instruments that they use. Now we have a vast set of arsenal of instruments and it's more the wisdom of using them. Uh, and one thing that the, at least this government has <coughs> is very clear is that, uh, you know, people get concerned whether the government is going to fight inflation or This government has very clear that inflation and volatility should be kept under control because they represent the people that most suffer with inflation and volatility. The markets do not suffer because inflation and volatility. They make money out of volatility. Yes? Uh, and the workers in low class, they don't. They lose. So this is very important to keep in mind. Hey, man, second row here, blue shirt. Thanks for your talk, João Carlos. Uh, Anthony Pereira, director of the Brazil Institute. Um, a lot of interpretations of Brazil's choices in terms of development revolve around an apparent dichotomy between economic liberalism, some version of economic liberalism, Anglo-American style of capitalism, or and something else, national developmentalism, statism. Um, and, and of course, the BNDES has been dragged into this debate because it's used, you know, it's used on, either, on both sides, but especially by economic liberals who are saying, you know, this is, this is inappropriate for the Brazilian states, crowding out private capital, it's distorting markets, and so on. So my question, your, your presentation really didn't revolve around that. So can we infer from your presentation that that's a that's a false dichotomy, that that's not really getting at the most important choices that Brazil has to make in terms of development? Or is that a real, is that a substantive debate? Wow. Um, the mainstream debate. I think it's always going to happen. Uh, the ideological debate over economic policy is going to, uh, uh, to happen. Uh, I, for me, the most, the thing that bothers me is the poor debate. Yes? Uh, the, 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 uh, the liberal versus the statism. It is, it is not that it's false, it's too simplistic in terms of opposing uh, two visions, yes? This is so, in terms of the debate, I think that the world is much uh, uh, more complex. Uh, and and, and it, again, this crisis is showing how governments are taking decisions that they would never take uh, uh, pri uh, uh, previous to 2007. This is one. The second one is related to uh, what interests people represent, yes? Um, the, the type of criticism that is done over uh, BNDES or over uh, the, 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 the decisions in terms of uh, interest rates or the macroprudential measures that uh, the government is taking uh, is very much taken by a market that uh, this market has a name and a surname. It's this financial market, the short-term people the people that plays with, and they only have a look in what is going to happen if I can make an extraordinary profit in six months or in a year, in a calendar year. Uh, these are the people that goes and, you know, and are more, the voice is very loud. If you look in terms of the long-term investors, uh, you see picture completely different, you know, the, the 62 billion uh, in terms of foreign direct investment last year is a sign of that. I was very much impressed by a British, uh, and it's a British group, uh, that uh, we sat uh, with them, with the chairman of the board, their CEO, about maybe a year ago. And these guys have, you know, their, their world sales is, I don't know, 30 billion uh, US or something, so large. And they have currently uh, around 10, if not, if not less, percent of the overall turnover in Brazil. And this guy comes and says, in 2020, 
we want to have 25% of our revenue coming from Brazil. And this guy is saying you know, it's not only the matter of the size, you know, from 10 to 25, but that he's looking 10 years ahead or 12 years ahead. So this is something I said, wow. This is a country that is starting to see the horizon, the economic horizon. Yeah? So I think that we should identify people that have, are playing the short term or the long term. I think it makes a difference. So I, just, I like this idea of the British businessmen who are thinking big and thinking long term. This is very good to celebrate. The man of the and thank you, Brazil. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Brazil. Uh, and then after that, Professor Wade. Bom, uh, boa noite, professor, e muito obrigado pela apresentação. So, good evening, professor, and thank you so much for the presentation. And my question is a question that I ask to myself daily since I arrived here at, at LSC last year to study development management. And it's basically, uh, what is your opinion, or what is the the role of Brazil and other developing countries in the global political system? And do you believe that we we Brazilians and other developing, developing world members can change this world and how we can do that? No, I don't think that uh, being from a developing country uh, changes, you know, you, you can be a developing country and be nasty. You know, it's, so it's not the category developed against developed. So let's, um, Professor Campos, where are you? Uh, a gentleman there, a professor at Brunel, he is uh, temporarily working, uh, not, not a temporary, more a, a permanent temporary, a DFID. Yeah? Uh, DFID put out, uh, by, uh, put out a call for a research. It is, uh, I, in the beginning, I was going, now uh, a comparison, not a comparison, but to study Brazil, it's a research to study Brazil on different angles in order to draw lessons or inspirations for Africa. Yeah? Not that the Brazilian model would be adequate to Africa or Africa's, but the institutions that Brazilian managed to develop, from the vocational training to the uh, minimum wage policy, if it could be something that could inspire the Africans. Yeah? Uh, in order to think their reality and take decisions. Uh, this is more or less the answer to me. So, okay. Professor Wade is So it's a, re a research that is going to be uh, run by um, people from, it's a network of researchers uh, coordinated by Manchester University. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. Um, Brazil's um, manufacturing sector has been very squeezed by imports of manufactured goods from China and other parts of East Asia. Um, on the other hand, China and other parts of East Asia have provided huge demand for uh, raw material exports from Brazil. Um, my question is to what extent Benedeas uh, or other parts of the Brazilian government are really making a very high priority of building up a national innovation system of the kind that you will have studied at SPRU all those years ago, SPRU at Sussex all those years ago, um, in order to try and um, uh, boost Brazilian manufacturing to get it to, a, a, in a sense, to leapfrog ahead of uh, Chinese manufacturing so that Brazil can remain a manufacturing center and remain a middle or, or develop a middle class that is associated with manufacturing type employment. To what extent is this actually happening and is it being effective? It is, it is a challenge, Professor Wade. It is a very, very tough challenge. Uh, because it is not only a matter of the policies in itself, and there are improvements in the policies, or the uh, money that is available from BNDES at a very good rate, but it's very much 
uh, a method of, this, of the decision of the uh, entrepreneur to either do or don't do. Yeah? So at, at the extreme, you know, people criticize a lot that uh, you know, the, the Benedict picks winners and all that. It's impossible to, to, to design a business and, and you know, create like the 3D printer. Okay, let's create a high-tech company here. <laughs> It's, it's not, yeah? So this is the first point. The second is that the Brazilian uh, economy, the, given the size, is very diversified in terms of the industrial base, yes? Um, uh, we have suffered uh, a lot uh, and will suffer the competition in the years to come. But some of its structural features will remain. Probably we are going to go Given the diversified industrial base, we're going to go for uh, some degree of specialization. Yeah? The capital goods industry maybe will be less diversified, but we'll have a capital goods industry. The car industry or the durable goods, it, it's going to be there, but more uh, narrow if you want. And in some other parts, we will uh, substitute uh, for, uh, for imports. The big challenge is to actually be, uh, be able to supply, this is why the demand-led perspective, I think it makes more sense, to supply the, uh, uh, those uh, areas of investment that are expanding, yes? Uh, so uh, everything related to logistics, <laughs> to energy, to the oil, to the agribusiness, uh, supplying for this. I think there are good chances that we improve, uh, that we will be able to, to sustain. Other activities, you know, and you have to go deeper, you know, if you go garment or, or, or the shoe production, uh, some of the subsectors uh, have been wiped out and some others are expanding. Yeah? So it is a more complex world, but I think that the manufacturing industry uh, will remain probably the relative size less, but not only should be concerned with the uh, manufacturing, the tradable and so on, but also with the uh, efficiency of, and, and the complex of the service sector that is still, you know, uh, open frontier uh, to improve. The productivity challenge that I put is a major challenge. It's but it's, uh, the government is very well aware, and the, and, and the measures are being put in a different scheme, but it is a long, it's a long fight. It's not, it's a long duration. It's not a short term uh, thing. Two rows back, Professor Barsley, and then the woman behind him. It's um, Michael Barzillet, uh Professor of Public Management here at the LSE. I have two quick comments and a question, okay? Uh, the comment is that the title of the, of the talk reminded me of an article that Hirschman co-authored with uh, Charles Lindblom in the early 60s uh, and, and published in A Bias for Hope. Um, it was about uh, economic development, research and development, and policy making, comparing different lines of arguments and drawing some conclusions. And um, uh, there seemed to be a, a common structure to your title in that article. Uh, I think the article actually took the ideas um, and compared them and drew some parallels, more sharp parallels. But I, so the second comment might be the parallels perhaps between these thinkers have to do with inventiveness, uh, ways of using um, uh, ideas and critiques of thinking as a basis for uh, breaking out of habits of thought um, as a way of moving forward. And, uh, well, there was a trace of that in the, in the lecture. I think it was but uh, a trace. And, and, and rather than calling attention to, to that, um, it looked as if you were looking uh, for quite a different solution, and that is uh, politics and a uh, kind of deus ex machina approach to politics as solving the problems, which I found surprising because if you study Brazilian um, development from inside the state, you'll find immense uh, inventiveness over the last 15 years. So the question is, um, what are you doing at Bayonet to bring a spirit of inventiveness 
particular via thought to planning or anything else you do in the in the bank. Do we have time for another <laughs> lecture? Yeah. Uh, This uh, Benny Diaz is a 60, 60 year institution. And it was designed um, very much with the project idea. Yeah, you have to, the, the, Benny Diaz is excellent in terms of putting a project up. And the tool is the uh, project evaluation manual that it comes from after it comes from the US after the world uh, war II and goes to the World Bank the reconstruction of Europe internal rate of return the, you know this very old instrument is still very much used in BNDES and as an institution if, if you go for a project for a factory or a hydro plant or anything that is tangible, it's, you know, uh, our delinquency rates are absolutely almost zero. Uh, there is this fiducia uh, in the society that BNDES, there uh, that is no cronyism, etc. Now, the challenge is, the, the, the challenge is the intangible side of things. How to finance the intangibles, yes? And to ask a banker to finance something that does not have a tangible guarantee is, oh, yeah? It's horrible. Um, so in terms of the uh, objective of financing, the bank is doing great efforts to move innovation, sustainability, local development, inclusion of micro business, right? As a, it's, it is a priority and you have to push this. Of course, remember what I said to Professor Wei, if the, if, the, if the businessman does not put an innovation project, it's hard to finish innovation. So in terms of it back, it's very clear. Internally, we change our credit evaluation methodology in order to, ha and we have a very sophisticated system in order to um, value the intangibles. So uh, we not only go on the quantitative, you know, the financial uh, sheets and how the, uh, all the data that is there, but we also put a third of the weight when we rate a company uh, on this qualitative evaluation that uh, raises the, the relative importance of the intangibles. And it is done in a collective way. The people, although the people from the credit evaluation can do the triple way independently, when they go to a company to do the evaluation, they go together with the people from the, uh, we have an investment bank. Investment bank and the area that is related to that company and the credit, so they go together. The mere fact that they have one instrument to look at the objective, but although their mandates are different, and they do this collectively, it's a major uh, change internally. Yeah? So if I can answer this, uh, two ways of going about. But it is, it, is, it is a long way of change. But it's going, it's going, you know. It's We'll move about the fifth row there, and then the man over here in the white shirt. Um, hi, my name is Vandana. Um, it's interesting that you say that it's uh, a little scary for a banker to be asked to look at the intangibles. But I thought that development banks work with a different objective. And my question is that I just saw you put up a slide, a very interesting slide, where you were looking at uh, the ratios of five development banks, and you had China Development Bank there. And China Development Bank is also a profit-making bank, uh, but it has um, uh, seems to have overstretched itself in certain sectors like solar. It's now probably 
exposed to the largest solar bankruptcy, SunTech. And so my question is, I wanted to ask you if there are any lessons that you think you can draw from the experience of China Development Bank, things that development banks ought to do and things that they ought not to do. Thank you. Development banks ought to follow the strategy, uh, the political strategy that was, uh, that is prevailing in a country that is uh, where it is uh, leaders were uh, elected and given a mandate. Yeah, so the mandate, uh, I don't know if we should, uh, uh, if we should follow the, you know, the what to do the China develop or, or not to do. Uh, what I find is that in the case of Brazil, uh, there is a clear mandate for BNDES uh, to, uh, 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 at this moment in time, to focus on infrastructure, innovation, local development, and, and in particular, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. So the credit conditions for these uh, areas are the best ones. Yeah, so, and we follow uh, what it is that there is the political mandate. In the history of the bank, the bank has survived in a, uh, well because it has always followed the, mand uh, uh, the, uh, the, the political directives that was given by whoever was in power. And I think that this is very relevant from uh, being a state institution, uh, especially now in the years of democracy in, the, in Brazil, it is, it is you know, people elected someone to do the things that they want. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, this is one. The second one is the ethical uh, behavior of the institution and, and the people that work on it. Uh, I, I am, uh, in, in, in Portuguese, Spanish also. Uh, the verb to be has two, dim two meanings. Yeah? One is a permanent one. Uh, eu sou. And, uh, estar and ser. Yeah? Ser is a sort of a permanent. Estar is a temporary. So I am in a temporary way from BNDES. Jaime is BNDES permanently. He's a career BNDES. <laughs> yeah, I'm temporarily there. Uh, what I, I have to say is that uh, what I learned from the people uh, from BNDES is that uh, they have it very clear that they are public servants. They serve the public interest, you know, literally. And this is, I think, is very important. I, you know, China is Chinese, the, the KFW is the KFW. <laughs> So I now must serve the public interest in a painful way by saying that we've run past our 8 p.m. closing time, but ask you all to forgive me for not being able to call on everyone and to join me in thanking John Carlos again. Thank you. Thank you.